the next bill we have is 1999 uh, with uh, Representative Agbaji. Uh, so welcome back to the committee. Uh, I will move House File 1999 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Uh, please uh, tell us about your bill. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and glad to be presenting in front of the committee again. Uh, so today I'm presenting House File 1999. It seeks $15 million to support small BIPOC-owned businesses across Minnesota. Uh, the purpose of the bill is to aid in the development of a growth fund that can support businesses into the future uh, with access to capital while leveraging non-state partnership dollars. So MEDA will be the grant recipient and they have a track record of providing grants and technical assistance to these small businesses over the years. And such assistance includes helping business owners make connections, obtain financing, earn a minority business enterprise certification, and get strategic business consultants to move their businesses forward. Uh, with that, I do have a number of testifiers with me, so I'll actually turn it over to them to speak more to the bill's impact and the importance of this bill to small businesses within the community. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Representative Agbaje. The, the first person I have is uh, Mr. McLean. Uh, McLean, uh, please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Warren McLean. I'm president of the Northside Economic Opportunity Network, NEON, and I'm also chair of the Catalyst Group. Uh, Catalyst was started in 2015 uh, by, by MEDA, and they had commissioned a study about minority and BIPOC businesses. What we found was that the, uh, the study was commissioned by, um, or performed by Accenture, and the study found that minority business development system was fragmented and poorly organized, underfunded, and lacked capital. <clears throat> It was segregated from the majority business development system. It didn't share information, clients, or capital resources. It could not support a critical mass of uh, BIPOC businesses that have a large scale impact on wealth and employment equality. Uh, from that, the Catalyst Group was formed. It's now developed to a high functioning business support ecosystem. It increases the quantity and quality of stage appropriate resources for BIPOC businesses. We reframe the way that BIPOC businesses are viewed away from a charity lens to one that recognizes value creation. And the ultimate goal is to create and support healthy growing BIPOC firms that generate good jobs, create wealth, and contribute to the state's GDP. Uh, last year, uh, the Catalyst Group provided support to more than 5,000 clients and provided more than 21,000 hours of technical assistance. We also um, introduced uh, the Minnesota Inclusive Growth Fund. Uh, this fund has generated uh, interest from the philanthropic and private sector and we'd like to see it leverage uh, resources from the state. Um, one of the things that <clears throat> we found that this fund will be used to really help uh, BIPOC businesses grow uh, and develop out of, the, uh, out of the pandemic, as well as the civil unrest that occurred last year. This fund will not, not only be limited to the Catalyst members, but will also support women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses, and businesses owned by disabled individuals. So thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next person is uh, Debo. Please uh, introduce yourself uh, for the record and proceed. Hi, uh, my name is Farrell Debo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee uh, for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm with ITC Transit. We're a type three school transportation based in St. Paul and service school districts throughout the metro area, including um, Ramsey, Hennepin, Dakota, and Washington County, and uh, many more. Um, we employ over 30, um, 30 drivers who uh, service um, homeless or highly mobile students, um, where the, as you guys know, the big yellow buses cannot um, get. We are in those niches to make sure the students are transported to the school so that they can get their education. Uh, families are very highly dependent on us, um, especially one just out of economics. They cannot take the children from home to school. Um, however, during um, the COVID-19, uh, this the restriction has dramatically uh, crippled us and um, brought our revenue down. While you know we still have to maintain our bills, um, but because of that we had to lay off many of our employees who depend um, on this work to provide for family and their community um, while 
Uh, we've been supported by organizations like AADS and securing some finances to uh, make sure that we're barely keeping up. Um, a lot of businesses have also shut down um, and this bill would be very instrumental for us um, as we continue the schools um, are opening up and students are getting back to school. So um, we are hoping to recruit back those who were laid off and then also hire more drivers uh, to support our community. And uh, with that, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. David. The next person is Mr. Jimenez. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Henry Jimenez, Executive Director of the Latino Economic Development Center and a member of Catalyst. I also serve as the Vice Chair. For years, our partners have come together to support the capital and technical assistance needs of BIPOC small businesses throughout the state. Like all of you, we are very much aware of the everyday needs of small businesses. Last year, we focused on ensuring that hundreds of small businesses access resources and funding needed to stay solvent. The Latino Economic Development Center alone is responsible for over 400 businesses securing over $12 million in emergency relief funding. And we did it while also addressing barriers our clients were facing both linguistically and culturally. LADC and Catalyst partners know well the need of our clients to access funding. This is not a new need, but one that has become even more apparent in the last year. Prior to the pandemic, our clients had a hard time accessing capital for their growing businesses. This hasn't changed during the pandemic, and it won't change after it if we don't do anything about it. We all know that our small businesses need in Minnesota, they need patient capital along with technical assistance. Catalyst partners have worked hard to help start, over, start or expand thousands of small businesses. From day one of this pandemic, we knew that our clients would need access to grants and loan products that were favorable to them to keep their business solvent. So we put our heads together and went to work as a coalition who has always put our clients first over individual organization growth. We decided to establish a Minnesota Inclusive Growth Fund. We have come together to raise funds that will have an even bigger impact among small businesses in Minnesota than we would have had alone. We continue to secure philanthropic and private funding, but as you know, we can't do this alone. We need our state to help us with this. We are here to ask you to invest in the Minnesota Inclusive Growth Fund. State funding will leverage our efforts in growing the fund to ensure we more, get more capital into the hands of Minnesota small businesses. The fund would be accessible to small businesses across the state of Minnesota, as well as other originating organizations, making this truly an inclusive fund and innovative both in Minnesota and the country. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I urge you to support House File 1999 to invest in BIPOC small businesses, to make a significant investment to ensure more small businesses have access to patient capital and are able to grow the Minnesota economy. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you so much. The next person is uh, uh, Ms. Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for giving me an opportunity to speak today. My name is Jackie Coleman and I am owner, president and CEO of Ingensa. And what we do is master planning or facility project planning for districts throughout the state of Minnesota. So basically we create safe and healthy environments for, for students. Uh, 2020 was a, a really good year for us um, in the beginning prior to COVID. Uh, Post-pandemic, a little more challenging uh, working with school districts. Uh, while we uh, had a lot of uh, work and a lot of clients because of COVID, uh, that work was placed on hold. So a lot of uh, revenue and financing was delayed. Uh, funding actually uh, will really help us realize our growth plan that uh, we haven't been able to realize uh, because of those delays. And really, uh, the funding will enable us to create jobs, um, not here just locally, but also throughout the state um, of Minnesota, primarily um, in rural areas. And uh, with that, uh, thank you again, and I'll answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the last testifier on my list is uh, Mr. Taisi. Please uh, welcome and introduce yourself for the record and proceed. You're muted. Go ahead. Sorry about that. 
Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and support. My name is TJ Ticey, and I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for Tri Construction. We are a small and growing GC general contractor with a specialty in drywall construction located in North Minneapolis. As a union contractor, we take pride in being members of the Carpenters, Painters, and Labor Union. We have a team of about 40 employees currently with opportunities to bring on even more as key projects begin. We have a strong working relationship with NEON and have utilized their consulting services to improve organizational capacity. And we have a financial relationship with the Community Reinvestment Fund. Both these agencies have assist, assisted us in growing our business. Tri Construction has been involved in the community rebuilding efforts since the George Floyd killing. We were directly involved in cleanup efforts on Broadway and Lake Street. We were a part of construction teams that completed the reconstruction and repair work on Cub Foods, Target, and the demolition, temporary bank trailer construction, and the planned rebuild of the U.S. bank property on Lake Street. Our biggest challenge is gaining access to capital to finance our current and anticipated growth in revenue. Like many BIPOC-owned businesses, we do not have access to capital or those banking relationships like our mainstream competition. We need access to capital to not only finance new projects that we're receiving, but to invest in the company, to hire additional resources with advanced skill levels to do our work. We need capital to invest in technology as well as our people to guarantee our ability to perform in these opportunities that we've earned. Companies like US Bank, the Phillips Family Foundation, Target and Cub have committed to work with BIPOC businesses and we want to be able to work with them to honor those commitments. Access to capital at reasonable terms are needed so that we can continue to create jobs, grow our business, and to improve our communities. Mr. Chair and to your committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much for your testimony. I think we have had that statement on uh, many fronts, access to capital and also reasonable time. So it's something that we will be looking into as we deliberate uh, uh, before the end of this session and ensuring that we provide uh, the support that is needed by our businesses who have been hit hard by COVID-19 and some of them uh, truly by the civil unrest that happened in Minneapolis. That's a conversation we will continue to have. With that, I open up for discussion. I see Representative Haley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks for bringing the bill forward, Representative Abadji. Um, I'm not sure who can answer this question, so I'll throw it out there. And, and um, one of the testifiers, I think it was Mr. McLean, you know, said the challenge uh, sometimes is that our, our efforts to fund businesses are very bifurcated and, and a streamlined process is, is you know, hard to produce. So I'm wondering, we have a couple other bills coming up, one from Representative Greenman for the NDC. Um, and I visited um, the NDC and I believe Mr. Jimenez and I, we've had some conversations um, about that. And so if, if somebody can give me an example, if I'm a minority business owner, where do I go first? And how do I know if I'm getting money or would the NDC fund me? Would this new Minnesota Inclusive Growth Fund be a resource? Would Catalyst be a resource? Can you just walk me through what that looks like? Um, and then secondly, Mr. Chair, maybe there's this follow up for the committee. Um, I would like to know from DEED, you know, how we have funded these various um, different uh, mechanisms in the past. Um, and that would probably help to give us a, a better idea of, you know, what's been working and, you know, what do we need to change to make things work better for minority business? Thank you. If Mr. I may Mr. start with Mr. McLean, and then I will ask uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, McKinnon just to walk us through some of the programs uh, through DEED. Yeah. Mr. McKinnon, uh, McLean. Thank you, uh, Chairman Noor. Um, Catalyst is a group of six organizations, uh, NEON, uh, Northside Economic Opportunity Network, Community Reinvestment Fund, uh, Latino Economic Development Center, uh, African Development Center, and uh, African Econo Economic Development Solutions. We meet on a weekly basis. So if a client comes to us and, and they need support, uh, depending on what the need is, we will work with the other organizations within the group 
uh, to develop, and as we stated here, age stage appropriate resources. So for instance, uh, as uh, Mr. Ticey indicated, uh, NEON and Community Reinvestment Fund uh, worked together on supporting his organization. Uh, they came to us with a capital need. Uh, we knew that we didn't have the, the, the scale to support them, but we provided the TA, but we brought in Community Reinvestment Fund as an organization that could provide the capital. And we worked together continually on that. And that's how Catalyst tends to function. And we have, uh, like I said, uh, regular communication with each other. So we know who our clients are, where the needs are, and that's how we support each other. Um, I would like to go to our Deputy Commissioner, McKinnon. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members, Kevin McKinnon, Deputy Commissioner uh, of Economic Development at DEED. Um, to Representative Haley's uh, question, how DEED works uh, with uh, a lot of these uh, organizations. Uh, we have a variety of programs. Um, I guess the first that I would just mention is uh, our technical assistance programming. We run some competitive grants uh, that provides funding to uh, a lot of these same organizations, uh, basically to provide that technical assistance for um, uh, BIPOC businesses, underserved businesses. Um, and oftentimes uh, uh, they also have access to uh, what we call our Emerging Entrepreneur Fund, uh, which is capital that we provide the nonprofits. Uh, it's about a $5 million loan fund right now um, that gets an, a million dollar appropriation every year um, that we make available to the nonprofits for their own lending uh, purposes. Uh, and so we have a great relationship with um, uh, a lot of these organizations, of course, they're all uh, recipients of either one or both of the two programs that I had just mentioned. Um, and, uh, and we continue to have outreach with them. In fact, uh, we just opened up our Emerging Entrepreneur Loan Program for uh, applicants, which we're required to do by law. Uh, and so we hope to have a number of uh, lenders come back uh, uh, and uh, and potentially add some new ones. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, Representative Haley. You, you're muted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll hold for now. You can go on to other members. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Jogans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm not sure, uh, it sounded like Representative Haley asked this question, but I'm not sure if I heard an answer. Has the, the appropriation ask in this bill is $15 million. How does that compare with past funding in the program? I, I don't think I heard it. It, it. Maybe I missed it. And then what are, what are the results of the, of the prior funding? Do we have any, do, can, we, can we point to actual, uh, you know, return on investment, I guess, if you, want to, if you want to look at it that way, but what have we, what, what have we received in return for, for past funding? Deputy Commissioner McKinnon, have we ever funded the cut list and uh, what, what is the track record on that? Uh, Mr. Chair uh, and members, uh, we have not funded uh, the Catalyst Group. Um, however, we funded many of the individual organizations, um, uh, including MEDA, um, with uh, a different uh, appropriation uh, over the years. Uh, I think that was maybe four years ago. Um, and yes, every year we do uh, reports on uh, the numbers of loans issued um, and the impact that it has uh, in, in the communities of which these loans are made. And we can make that available to you. Representative Jones. Okay, thank you. And, and I'm looking in the, uh, the bill language, I don't see it. Is it listed in statute? Is there an administrative fee that MEDA would be able to uh, take out of any, any of the, the work that they're doing? Uh, any of the uh, cut list members who wants to answer that question? Deputy Commissioner. Mr. Chair and Representative Juergens, um, I can't speak uh, to this uh, proposal that's in front of you, but I can speak to 
um, how our uh, lenders that we work with through our program work. Um, they basically keep the um, interest uh, that is generated from the loans and that's what helps underwrite their loan committees and their ongoing uh, loan management and monitoring uh, for these, uh, for the loans that they do. And just to add on to that, uh, I just wanted to note for this committee, there's uh, the base uh, requirement for the market rate uh, interest plus, I believe, 4%, the way the emerging entrepreneur really works to fund the, uh, some of the CDFIs, uh, almost all of them. Uh, so sometimes it becomes uh, the question about reasonable terms uh, can, should I go to a bank and pay that uh, cost or should I go to a CDFI but whereby we're not providing them with the additional support to help uh, the underserved uh, businesses? So those are questions that we'll have to discuss in the coming days as we talk about various uh, financing mechanisms that we have through DID. I don't know if that helps. Uh, at this point, I think uh, the... Uh, the members, uh, I saw Mr. Jimenez, if you wanted to quickly respond. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I could, what I could tell you now is that the uh, interest rates that will come out of the uh, uh, fund are going to be uh, uh, as small as possible as we can make them as low as 4%. Um, and this is money that would come into a, a fund. Uh, the reason MIDA is mentioned in this bill is because Catalyst Partners, uh, MIDA is the um, uh, fiscal agent for the partnership, but the actual funds will go into this joint fund called the Minnesota Inclusive Growth Fund. Um, but I could assure you that the amount of time and technical assistance that we spend on every client is, is substantial. And um, even at a 4% interest rate, we're, you know, we're, we're still having to uh, raise funds for our our organizations to be able to provide that technical assistance. So there's there's a lot more than just a percentage. I, I can assure you that uh, none of our organizations are are making money off of this. We're, what we're trying to do is raise funds to be able to provide more funding to uh, uh, businesses across the state. Which, mind you, we're actually coming to this. Uh, with funding, uh, uh, we're still working with the philanthropic world and private donors to bring in funding. We're not just asking the state to start from zero. We're, we're actually coming with, uh, with uh, commitments here uh, as well. This is well, uh, Go ahead, Mr. McLean. Uh, um, the way the fund is structured, this is really a request for capital. Um, and so as the fund is structured, there'll be an origination fee that will be paid uh, to each uh, organization that originates the fund, I mean, originates a loan uh, that will be sold into the fund. So the, the structure does not, when, this is not a request for administrative fees, but the way that the structure, that the fund is, uh, again, structured is that there'll be origination fees that will cover the administrative costs of all the participants. Representative Jogens, uh, any follow-up before we go to the uh, conclusion to the author of the bill? No, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Representative Agbaje, any closing remarks? Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I would just uh, reiterate what a number of the testifiers spoke to today. This is really about an investment in our small businesses that are owned by our BIPOC community members. And, you know, this is an investment that I think the state should be making um, so that we can continue to show our support as, as these businesses also deserve our attention um, as they require the access to capital to uh, not only sustain themselves, but also to grow. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. So I, I renew my motion, House File 1999, be laid over for possible inclusion. So thank you to everyone who came and testified. Uh, looking forward to more conversation in the coming days.